a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute was also influenced by Chris Corfus' presentation at the seminar, and that's the two-to-one brake squat. Similar to the brake squat, you want to make sure that the strap is long enough for you to get full extension all the way up in your toes. From there, give the wheel a spin and sink into the squat. When the tension is set, drive up as hard as you can to full extension. Pick up one of your feet and try to stop the strap as fast as you can without letting your heel hit the ground. Spin the wheel, try with the other leg. This is a great exercise that has awesome carryover to how you stop in your change of direction and agility work, and one that athletes will 100% see the correlation between how they move and the exercise. Give this one a try. I'm sure it's one that not only you'll love, but your athletes will enjoy as well. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Doc, great to have you back, man. Jay, I think this is, uh, man, it's been a few years, but uh, it's great to be back. I think, what, number four, number five, something like that? I got no idea. Yeah, I think that this is the ring for the thumb, man. I think this is number five. Ooh, uh, baby. You know, and, and the last time we, we got together to talk about some stuff, we were talking about equations again. Uh, yeah. Which is what we're going to dive down the rabbit hole of today. Yeah, man. Let's so, do it. Yeah. So let's get going to it, man. Let's. Let's start talking a little bit, first of all, where these ideas came from and sort of the, the reasoning behind it and, and how it fits into some of the discussion that there's been going on when it, when it comes to performance training in college. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll get to my journey on it. I can't really speak for, you know, where it comes from other than really good, smart people with math. You know, the people who say I never have to use algebra again or never had to use it in their life. I'm like, man, it, let, let's let's I'm nowhere near as effective if I don't use algebra on a, a damn near daily basis and physics and things like that. But, you know, maybe it's a little bit different. But here's the deal is that uh, what let's go back to the vertical jump equations like we talked about last time. Right. So if somebody's jumping the same height, but they put on 10 pounds, you know, five kilos they're a lot more powerful because, uh, you know, uh, the jump height is dependent on the speed of center of mass on takeoff. And to be able to get a larger mass to that same velocity, you've got to have a lot more power to get there, right? Power is force times velocity, force is mass times acceleration. If we have a larger mass that has to be at the same acceleration or even slightly greater, obviously that's a greater uh, force. And if it's the same velocity with a greater force, well, that's greater power, right? So, uh, but, I mean, that's just it mathematically. And then we can apply that same concept to sprinting. And this, you know, I, I've been for years critical uh, with strength and conditioning uh, about the fact that, hey, we're not improving speed. We're not improving speed. We're not improving speed. After the first year, what are we doing? And uh, come to find out, that, uh, you know, after reading this paper in, I believe it was 2008, let me just double check. I, I pulled it up so I don't misquote it. 2008 paper from Daniel Baker and Robert Newton. I, I say Daniel, it feels weird calling them by their full names, Dan Baker and Rob Newton, uh, that, uh, you know, it was the comparison of lower body strength, power, acceleration, speed, agility, and sprint momentum to describe and compare playing rank among professional rugby players. 
So what they did in this paper, which you know, I've talked about it before, but uh, they had the national squad and the state squad. So think basically like uh, a, a team, B team or varsity JV. You know, typically your JV players are going to grow up and become your varsity players. But let's see, what are the differences now? Well, in their study, they actually, I'm coming down to the chart so I don't misquote anything because I, man, people love to, you know, nail me if I say something wrong. I, 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 you know, whatever. Like nobody's ever said the wrong thing before. Uh, that the there was no difference in height between the guys. There was a centimeter, right? Let's see, where is it at? I think it was 1.84 versus 1.85 meters. So the height was no different. Uh, and some people keep saying with this paper, they're like, oh, well, they didn't account for height. They didn't account for height in this equation. Yeah, they didn't need to account for height. It's not different. So what the, it's not going to make any difference, literally. Uh, 184.4 and 185.2. That's 0.8 centimeters. Dude, that's, man, I don't know if my, my finger and thumb can get that close. Uh, but they were significantly different in their body weight and they were different in age, right? Well, yeah, no shit. The developmental comes all the way up. Man, I, I should have more caffeine. I am, I'm using some profanity here. I apologize. I'm usually better about that. I'm on, uh, got some prednisone for a sinus infection and it's, uh, it's got me jacked up a little bit. I'm all hopped up on Mountain Dew. Uh, at least you'll get that joke. No, Some people I, will. Other people. I, gosh, I hope everyone gets that joke. Holy Man. mackerel. Dude, I, I told some Tommy Boy jokes in my classes recently, and they fell flat. Nobody knew what I was talking about. Come on. But, uh, yeah, exactly, man. That's what I'm saying. This is a classic comedy. But if we look at the, uh, the sprint times, get back to the speeds of these guys, the state rugby, right, the, the JV team, they were actually a little bit faster than the national squad. But whenever you factor in body weight, right, then it was a large significant difference between the two. So what is that telling us? Is that this is a no duh thing, but a person who is larger and just as fast is going to hit harder. Now we can't really calculate uh, force very well. Uh, and what do I mean by that is that, um, I mean, yeah, we could calculate it for it equals mass times acceleration, but to go into that, uh, the acceleration and things like that, you've got coefficients of drag, uh, friction, uh, and the drag is going to be uh, impacted by, of course, the temperature and the barometric pressure. So if you're not accounting for all of those things, you don't have a, a uh, logical leg to stand on unless every single person ran at the exact same time in the exact same conditions you know if it were controlled like that uh, and even then it's still a little little hairy but we could use this thing called momentum and momentum is just mass times velocity that's it and so then that gives you k kilogram meter per second and the unit is a p right you know like watts is for uh, power well this is just a, a p now, what I've done with that, actually, and I guess this is a, a paper that I'm submitting here soon, so I really shouldn't say this, but, you know, whatever. Is somebody going to scoop me if I'm submitting it already? There, That would mean that it's like, a, yeah, whatever. Who cares? So I had this thought, like, hey, what about if we use momentum like I used power? And I'll be damned if I didn't find that while there was not an improvement in sprint times for years two, three, and four, every year saw a significant improvement in momentum because the body weight had changed. So it's a way to see, it's like, hey man, is this, is this weight functional? Do they possess more momentum? Okay. Now, is that saying that that's gonna necessarily be appropriate for every sport and every position? Well, no. Uh, it's going to be great for the big guys, but for a skill position or a sport where they're not having to overcome another mass, you know, where inertia is not super important, it might just be velocity. And, uh, you know, there's papers out there showing that. Uh, like there's a, a paper from a guy named Headland. I can't remember the, uh, I think it was 2017. And I can't remember the name of the article, but basically he was looking at uh, how do you guys make the Pro Bowl? And if a person was in a skill position and they ran, uh, and it might even be skill and mid, 
if they ran slower than a four five nine at the combine, they were making the Pro Bowl. I mean, there was like ten percent of the people who were a little bit slower made it. You know, it's like uh, the, I haven't seen another Steve Largent since he was, uh, you know, since the '80s. Well, he's not going to make it in today's game. Uh, and it just kind of goes to show that. So it's just getting to what is important here. Now, for the big and the mid positions, it's the, the momentum's going to matter. Uh, the skill positions, velocity might be the more important thing. And maybe we need to find something with velocity and height and wingspan. That would probably really do a, a good job of uh, prediction, uh, especially for receivers and defensive backs, because that's, you know, uh, uh, defensive area or catchable area is, is increased uh, with the, with the speed. So then that would just be a differentiator, but you know, uh, there who's to, to say what's, uh, what's going to be better there, but it was really interesting to me that, Hey, uh, this is something I've been extremely critical of and I've been critical of the wrong thing. Um, it was that I needed to be critical about just simply looking at time. And it's one of those things that's like, man, I've been doing this 20 years. And I didn't think of that. Uh, how many other people, what else am I, have, have I jacked up that, you know, I'm looking at the wrong way for 20 years, but this momentum thing, you know, it, it's caught a lot of traction and I've got it, you know, hat tip of the hat to Mike Boyle for, uh, he's like, Hey, there's no way to do this. I wish there was. And, and on social media, I'm like, yeah, actually Mike, there is. And he's taken it and, and ran with it. And uh, you know, there's some people who, who are misdoing some calculations and that that's okay. Uh, but, I, you know, it's usually pretty easy uh, to fix just because it's like, oh, they might be doing yards or pounds or something else. So then the, the equation doesn't come out right. But uh, as long as you're using the same units every time, you'll know the number went up or down. It's uh, bathroom scale theory. It's just not valid. It would be reliable, but it wouldn't be valid. Uh, so looking at things that way, man. So it's been uh, it's pretty cool. Um, We've got some stuff that'll be coming out on uh, differences between positions. That'll be the next one. Um, normative values for different divisions uh, and uh, differences in starters and non-starters within the position groups. So, you know, we've got a bunch of stuff coming out on momentum. I think that that's pretty exciting. It's just another way to look at it. And we could even do that with change of direction too. Because what is change of direction? Well, you've got a distance and you've got a time. If you've got a distance and a time, you've got a velocity. Right. And all you do is you put whatever the distance is in meters in the numerator and you put the time in the denominator. Dude, that's a, another cell in Excel. That's it. If you know how to click and drag and you can write a formula, you can calculate momentum, you can calculate velocity, you can calculate a lot of things. And shoot, you could even calculate uh, power from standing long jump since that just got accepted, you know, for, uh, for JSCR. Uh, so that, that should be in the publish out of print in the next week or two. Um, so that's something else that I'm pretty jacked up about, you know, so that now that we've got a, a, um, validated equation, uh, to look at the changes in power estimated from the standing long jump. So then that gives us the ability to, to look at it just like we do with counter movement jump to see what happened with the changes in body weight. Uh, yeah, isn't any of this perfect? No there's going to definitely be error. If somebody goes on the force plates and they jump and, uh, you know, the, the, and the, the equation said they put out, you know, 700 watts and the force plate said, you know, 660. Yeah, it's off. Who cares? There's going to be standard error. It, this is an estimation versus a direct measurement. Direct measurements are always more accurate. It's like heart rate for Christ's sake. You know, it, everybody thinks that 220 minus age is the way to do max heart rate. And that's the most ludicrous thing that I've ever heard in my life. Uh, the standard deviation on that is 10 beats per minute, right? No, and so, that's not even close because I'm like three standard deviations off of that. Yeah, yeah, right. and that's just within one standard deviation. Yeah, you, that, yeah, you're not an outlier. So for the general population, it's plus or minus 10 beats. So, you know, that's just absolutely ridiculous that, uh, you know, I always tell people, if you've got the ability to measure, why are you estimating? You know, if you do a conditioning test, you take your max heart rate from that. It's stupid, you know, I'd rather be right than lucky. You know, they're going with VBT, that's, uh, they, I use the VBT for load selection on things because I'd rather be right than lucky uh, because of all the different system and their different adaptation, you know, times. But man, and I'm starting to feel like Buddy Morris. I think you've said two words here and I've been on like a, a you know, 15 minute just roll and rant here, but yeah. Uh, I love it. I, I, first of all, if you have the ability to measure, why are you estimating? 
Like that should be a t-shirt trademark that. Yeah. That's well, like, that's making me like even be a little disappointed in myself with some things. But I think that even more so when we look at these tests, I didn't know the long jump got the thumbs up. Oh yeah. Yeah. I haven't, uh, I think I'm, yeah, I haven't been uh, huge on promoting anything lately. I've been on off social media to save my sanity. Right. Well, I mean, I wish I could save my sanity, but when you look at that, like, how would you look at those differently? Like, how would you look at the vertical versus the long jump? Because obviously now we're talking about gravity, right? Yeah. And would, maybe I'm overthinking it, but when I look at those, I'm almost thinking like how, uh, was it Cressy that had uh, that formula about like explosive strength versus max strength when you looked at like your squat versus your vertical or something oh like that. dude that was uh, that's yeah that uh, so it was that's your and then eric was the one that talked about it a lot or well probably because eric did his uh masters at penn state right and that's where uh, that's your was right uh oh no he did a yukon with kramer yeah. and kramer is a co-author for uh for that so yeah that explosive strength deficit where they looked at the differences yeah, off of the force plate yeah and, you know, I've done something with it that uh, I've put out in a couple of, you know, actually, this is going way back. This is like a more than it. This is probably like 15 years ago, man. In the, you know, whenever uh, Adam Fight, myself, Donnell Boucher and uh, Andy Altoff founded that uh, Young Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association, which is pretty much, you know, I mean, it's not around anymore. But I talked about because we're the, not young anymore either. Yeah, right. It's freaking, <laughs> we're both gray beards, man. Look at that shit. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking about taking a, a note from some of my buddies. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna throw them under the bus, but getting that just for men and gray out in my beard here. I uh, would, but it, thanks to Chase Campbell, I will always be gray beard. So like now, like I can't. Like that's just I'm stuck. Like Chase dubbed me, so I'm I I gotta live with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're good enough shape now that where you could shave it off and you'd be okay. You know, me with the double chin, it still it just looks bad. So. Uh, yeah, I got to get the beard long. I keep saying I'm going to grow it out so long and braid that shit that, uh, you know, but, um, uh, that, uh, I, I have a feeling I would be a single, uh, single person again and uh, not seeing my kids if I grew my beard out and did that. And, but, uh, that's just something I threatened to do. Um, but yeah, but I wrote about it then. So what I did actually was I used the Sears equation for the numerator for the power. Right. So you've got a rate limited explosive activity divided by a non rate limited activity. And then uh, he multiplied that by 100 because you're looking at, for him, off the force plates, it was Newtons and Newtons, right? Uh, and it was two different types of jumps. It was the counter movement jump and the, I believe it was a jump, uh, a squat jump, I think. I'd have to, somebody stole my version, the green copy. So now I've got the new one, which is pretty cool. The coolest thing in the world is whenever your work gets recognized by others, and VBT actually made uh, this edition of Science and Practice of Strength Training. One of the nice. what I can yeah, what I consider one of the foundational texts, man. I I'm like holy cow, it's this is uh, this is awesome. We put in some uh, things in there to make sure that it was uh, more right than what I've been in the past uh, because you know I had there's going to be sampling error uh, because dude, all, if all I've got is Division One athletes and a couple of sports. Well, of course, you know, there's going to be that, but that, that popped out, but back, uh, but back to it, uh, took the numerator as uh, the power from the counter movement jump. And I divided by took just a total load for squat. So squat plus body weight. There's a debate on, should you go 80%? Cause do the shanks actually do something? It's like, man, I'm just doing hundred percent. Cause uh, you know, sometimes my calves have gotten sore after I squatted. So they got to be doing something. Uh, and, and that wasn't very scientific at all, but the uh, there's something called a non-pyrometric chi-squared analysis that showed that, yeah, that this projects out to a, a normal thing. So what I did was, you know, get the numerators, the power, divided by the kilogram total, and that just give, gives you a number, right? So that gives you what watts per watts per kg, right? But that's uh, a, a force essentially instead of uh, instead of whatever. So it's not really truly relative, but I guess it is kind of relative because body weight's included. Why did I include body weight? Well, dude, if you, you know, uh, you and I have the same squat max 
and I weigh a lot more than you, your relative strength is higher than mine. So I put that in there because then that would have a small, so if it were me, I would have that smaller difference between the two where you would have the larger difference between the two, you would have the larger number, I would have the smaller number as the total score. Then I standardized it. Uh, and then why did I standardize the score? Well, assuming that you know a, a team is gonna be a normal distribution, especially with a football team, because you got so many dudes, right? So then uh, if they were more positive than positive one, that means since the numerator was explosive, right? If they, they were more positive than positive one, that meant they were too explosive for how strong they were. And if they get strong, they'll probably need to get stronger to stay healthy, okay? Uh, and if we look back, yeah, most of those guys were like under 1.5 times their body weight, 1.4. I mean, they were, they were weaker dudes that could just jump out the gym. And then on the flip side of that, if you're more negative than negative one, you're too strong for how explosive you are. And you need to quit worrying about moving so big a weight and start moving it fast and improve the co-contraction ability, improve the rate coding uh, that's being sent down from the nervous system. So, you know, that was just a, another metric that we used there. Uh, now, I will say that I broke it down. I think you could do it two ways. I think you could look at it allometrically by body weight. But what I chose to do instead that I thought was a little bit more solid was I broke it into positional groups, right? Middle, big, and skill, and then ran it that way. Uh, so that the standardizations were a little bit, uh, you know, Dr. Andy Fry call, has a, uh, that looks about right method, a TLAR method, you know, you put your thumb up, well, does that look about right? Well, it, uh, whenever I did it as a total team, it didn't look right. But then whenever I broke it out by positions, uh, it, it did. Uh, and what do I mean by it did? So if you know that you've got this super ass explosive offense, somebody who's extremely explosive for offensive lineman or defensive tackle, and they're the most explosive you've ever seen in your career, and you've been doing this for 20 years, they're still not probably going to be very explosive as compared to a skill player. So then that kind of let that, you know, that, that come out in a wash. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a, another thing that I've done with, uh, with the numbers. And I need to publish that. I just don't know how, man. Do I publish it saying, hey, I, uh, I, I redneck engineered this way to, uh, to do this without force plates? And uh, this was what I was trying to go after. And, you know, hopefully somebody like Jay Dawes or somebody else that's smart can help me write that up and figure out how to, to, to make it fly for research. But as far as a practitioner goes, man, we, we use the crap out of that to know what to give somebody for, you know, what type of programming they needed. Well, it kind of answers the question of how strong is strong enough. Yeah. And it's kind of getting towards that transfer, uh, you know, like, how strong is strong enough in the transfer? I didn't directly look at the, the strength in there, but yeah, no, it definitely, it gets there. Uh, and, you know, what is the ratio between the two? And there, there's got to be one. I mean, if you're too explosive for how strong you are, you've got a really high risk of getting hurt. If you are too strong for how explosive you are, you've got a really high risk of sucking. So, you know, you've got to make sure that we balance all of these things out uh, so that we uh, have the, the good performance that's awesome you have a really high risk of sucking i was actually thinking more along the lines of like if you're too strong i would probably guess you would have more of the risk of like a muscular injury versus if you're too if you're too far on that explosive side you're looking more tendinous ligament type injury because say that's fair snappy and like you don't have the ability to stop things yeah but you know we didn't it seems like to me we would need to have a way to evaluate the stretch shortening cycle to evaluate right that. i was just gonna say like full disclosure like like what's what do we need here like it's a disclaimer like this yeah. is just me shooting off the cuff i have no idea i have not tested or evaluated this please do not take this as medical advice or whatever yeah, right, yeah, like yeah. all that, but just thinking of it logically, which we all right. know is very hard to do today. Yeah. Um, it would at least the the explosive too high, I would think, would be more risky of the tenderness issues, unless it happens because things like their Achilles tendon are so developed and are so yeah. resilient that that's really all that they use to move. Yeah. And you could look at that. I mean, if you've got EMG with uh, an electrode, there's something called a, uh, 
Hoffman reflex, where you look at the H wave divided by the M wave, and one of them is the, uh, the time that it takes for the signal to go up to the A1 afferent nerve back down the efferent for the contraction. And then the other is looking at the, the uh, muscle activation level and uh, the, from coming back from central all the way down and uh, looking at the differences between those two. And that's basically, what is that? That's an evaluation of the stretch shortening cycle without having to get some, you know, take the muscle out, muscle fiber out from a biopsy and, and test it that way. So that's a uh, non-invasive means. Now it's a pain in the ass means. Uh, and it's something that uh, it would take a lot of time and I don't want everybody thinking, oh my God, I got to go do this. Well, no, there's a reason why there's not a lot of uh, work on it, especially with athletes, because it's a, it's a pain in the ass to, to set up and, and do, and it feels weird. Uh, but it's it's something that you could do theoretically and, and look at that way. So let me play devil's advocate with those metrics there for a second. Yeah. What would you say to the person who would argue that you squatting the same weight as me would be the opposite because pound for pound, I might be stronger? That's exactly why I put it in there, right? Because I wanted to see that because pound for pound, you are stronger. But if we just look at the, the 600 pound squat, let's say, then there's no differentiation for my body mass and your body mass. You've got the greater relative strength. So that would actually give you a better score, right? Uh, versus mine would cause that number to be smaller because I have a, uh, and be at a greater risk of sucking, right? Uh, because of um, the, uh, the two coming together that it would be, more total kilograms per watt you would have more total watts per kilogram roger i got that yeah so, but now i want to go back to momentum for a second because i think yeah. another thing if we're talking about the 40 one thing that would also intrigue me is you know eman and i spoke a few years back about how we broke down the 40 into mm -hmm. segments i wonder how that could fit in with something like this and in evaluating that so that not only could we look at the momentum aspect, but how quickly that was built. Oh, dude, that's, that's super easy. Right. So all that you would do. Well, and how is, important could that be? You know what I'm well, saying? Well, it could be extremely important uh, to know where somebody's hitting their, their maxes at. And it depends on uh, what, how many splits that you've got. If you've only got like a 10 and a, let's say you even went 10, 20, 40, right? So then we could uh, divide all of those out and see where's your deficiency lie. And actually what I would probably do is I would go back to those positional groups again and Z-score those and see, and I would, uh, and even if I wasn't just Z-scoring, I would look and see if there was a difference between the starters and non-starters uh, at those you know, levels right at that 10, the 10 momentum, the 20 momentum and the 40 momentum, you know, the 20 to 40. And you could of course break it up however you want it. Uh, but then again, at the same time though, as we're talking about this, I need to bring up the Samazino method. So if you take a ton of splits or you're using a radar gun uh, and the good thing about the radar gun is a good radar gun costs you about 600 bucks, right? And they set a timing gate. So I mean, they're like what, 1200 a gate? So then that, that's uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. So that would be four gates. So that would be $8,000 versus 700 bucks. And uh, so then you can, uh, if you get it on the, that continuous, you could take that data and you could throw it in the uh, Samazino. Or if you have multiple splits, you could throw it in the Samazino method. And that method uh, for the horizontal force velocity profiling, the R squared, like the ability to predict it versus the, uh, I think it's a 60 meter, 100 meter uh, track in Japan that's all triple, uh, you know, multi axis force plates. It was up, the R square was up in the point nines. So you could either spend a million dollars on force plates or you could uh, use a radar gun or some timing gates and you'll be 99% right. You know, and I'll, I'll do it for that cost difference, I'll take it every time. And then that would actually, the great thing about that is that you can look at the core, the, the percentages of vertical and horizontal force and velocity. Now you also do need to have, of course, the, uh, the height of the individual, the uh, barometric pressure and the temperature uh, for that method to be valid, 
uh, but dude, you, you freaking open up your phone and you can find that shit real quick. Uh, or you've got a little probe, got a temperature probe, throw that sucker up into the air real quick and you'll get the, the humidity, barometric pressure, temperature, and all that stuff that would be used to calculate the air drag. And uh, that's well, what shoot, happened. 10 months out of the year, you got to use that anyway with the sports med people. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So they, they got it. So just yeah. get the data from them, man. So it's not anything extra on you, but you know, it's just, hey, there's so much that we can do to get so much more information. And it's not even that freaking hard. Uh, you know, if you can use Excel, you can find out a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. And I think that that's really the big thing with it, right? Is that as long as you just double check your equation, it's an easy drag and drop. And it's, yeah, a lot of them are really not that far off each other. No, no, no. I mean, and there's always the people are worried about the um, the uh, the difference. Which equation is the most accurate? Man, you know what? It's bathroom scale theory. You know, if it went up or it went down, it doesn't matter. It's like, well, this one's got uh, 20 watt standard error. This one's got 24. So I want to use the 20 watt one. I want to change everything, dude. Who cares, man? It, it, it's kind of eh, no. I'm not going there. Uh, it, it, that that would be bad, um, but it, you know, I was trying to think about the the comparisons. You know that it, it just doesn't matter as long as you use the same equation every time. It it doesn't matter. You're going to get the same numbers. They're going to scale the same way. Yeah, you might have four fifty two instead of four fifty six, and who cares? And really, who cares? Because that is an estimation and not a direct measurement. So you've got standard error either way, and you're probably wrong and off on both of them. So, I mean, who cares? Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's kind of like when you're using some of the the devices or the metrics that aren't as accurate, as long as you're constantly using the same thing. Yeah. Right, like if we're just talking about bar velocity, like there are some- As long as it's reliable, right? Right, as long as it's always off the same amount, it's always off the same amount, like- it, it depends if you would look at the same percent, but the, like there's some of the units and I'll let people go look at the paper. I think it was Amador Garcia Ramos whenever he, uh, I think he had like eight different devices, but some of them were off weird. Like they were on for about 15 or 20%, like the 60 to 80% of one RM, but then they got really wacky greater than 80% and they were really wacky less than 40%. So, or I'm sorry, 60%. So, I mean, it was just like, okay. Dude, if all your training is between 60 and 80 percent, you're set. Otherwise, you're dealing with circus numbers. But as long as that device or the equation is reliable at all, you're set. Like your bathroom scale, it's reliable. Might not be valid, but it is reliable. Yeah, and that's what's most important. Yeah, as long as the device is reliable. To me, sometimes that's more important than uh, having the biggest validity. And it's the same with the equations. You yeah, know, exactly. It's, it's, it's long as it's as long as you're not comparing different equations for looking at the same thing, it's. And if you are, you better be doing a cross validation study because why the hell right. would you do it otherwise? Yeah. And just, uh, cause that's just, it's ridiculous. You're creating more work for yourself for yeah, what? No doubt. For a headache. Yeah. yeah. Dude, have kids. That'll do it. For, that'll give you plenty of headaches. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I love it. Well, doc, man, this is like, chock full of great stuff this is one people are going to have to uh rewind and go back through because there's a ton of simple ways that people can end up diving deeper into their metrics and finding out if the things that we are getting upset about and frustrated about maybe we're not getting upset and frustrated about the right things or yeah. we shouldn't be getting upset or frustrated about them at all because things are going well yeah yeah dude hundred percent looking at the momentum stuff. I can remember being so pissed at myself and so pissed about everything in the industry before. And then when I read that paper from Dan and, and reached out to him and talked to him about it, I was like, man, I'm the biggest freaking moron in the world. How did I never do it? It's just freaking math, man. And I could have done this and the whole time and been right rather than being up on a stage before and, and hammering my hand down saying, this is stupid. This is stupid. No, you're stupid. dumbass. You're the one that never thought of this before. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's good stuff. It's great stuff. And it's, 
luckily Simple. for us, some stuff that you're going to dive even deeper into in the manual. So I'm fired up for yeah. that. Yeah, they, dude. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, man. Having that come out. So hopefully, uh, it'll be the the uh, the most well done, quickest written chapter on the basics of biomechanics. Uh, you know, just to equations and getting uh, in parsimony. Uh, is what I should say for that. I love it. Doing more with less. But yeah, man, Doctor Man's back. The manual, volume six. Spoiler. That's the uh, the first thing we're going to give you guys with that, but it's going to be rad. But Doc, as always, brother, it's great to see you. It's grateful for your time. I'm glad you're doing awesome, man. I truly appreciate you being on. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch soon, brother. Sounds good. Yeah, man. Cheers. Cheers.